So, we continue with our discussions on the grid routing algorithms. So, as I said uh, we shall be discussing some more algorithms in this lecture, which are more efficient in terms of the running time and also the storage complexities. Let us see. The first one is called Hadlock's algorithm. This, this method let me tell you first, this is similar to Lee's algorithm in the sense that here also we are labeling some cells with numbers, but the way we are labeling the way the wave fronts are progressing are very different. Because in Lee's algorithm you just try to recall the basic mechanism, you are trying to propagate the numbering or the wave front in all directions without any consideration as to which direction the target is actually located. So, if the target was located there, you are also propagating wave front in the other direction in Lee's algorithm, but in Hadlock's algorithm you specifically keep track of a of the fact that whether you are moving in the right direction or in the reverse direction. You always give priority if you are moving in the right direction. Okay. So, you are avoiding unnecessary expansion of the wave fronts in the reverse direction, which will obviously require much less number of cells to be numbered, which of course, uh, will result in much faster run times, but let us see the basic concept here. So, the cell labeling scheme that is used in Hadlock's algorithm uh, uses something called detour numbers. Now, what is a detour? Let me just, just explain the concept of detour with the help of a diagram first. Let us say, so I have a source here, I have a destination here. So, I want to find out a path from S to D like this. Now, suppose due to some reason means I cannot find a path like this, I may see that in order to find a path, I may have to go away from D, then again I may have to come back towards D, a path like this. Now, this move where I am moving away from D, this is called a detour. Here I am moving away from D, but but other than this segment, you see nowhere else in this path we are using a detour. Say from here we are moving in the right direction, here also we are moving in the right direction, but here we are having a detour. Now the number of cells that you are moving away from with respect to D, that is called the detour number. Okay this is the idea. So, the detour number let us see, the detour number of a path P that connects two cells is defined as the number of grid cells directed away from the target. Now, you look at the entire path, you find out in how many grid cells you are actually moving away from the target that will be your number d p. Now, one thing also you try to understand, now in this example, so you are moving away in this part. So, the amount of movement you are doing away, you will have to come back by the same amount again. So, you are moving away you will again have to come back. So, that this amount of d p you are moving away that d p also will have to be added while you are coming back. So, that is why the length of the path with respect to the d 2 number here, you can estimate as the Manhattan distance between s and t, which is the expected shortest path, which may not be there. That Manhattan distance plus twice the detour number. So, once you go go to the to the away direction, 
will have to again come back by that amount. Okay. So, this is how we are estimating the length of the path and the idea behind Hadlock algorithm is that you use the detour numbers to label the cells. So, the cell filling is similar to Lee's algorithm, the difference is that you fill the cell with the detour number and not by its distance and the cells which are having smaller D2 numbers are expanded with higher priority. And there is another point here, you see in Lee's algorithm at every step we are labeling a neighbor, in the next step the neighbor of the neighbor, but in Hadlock's algorithm we go on labeling as long as we are moving in the same direction in the same step. Like for example, as long as we are, we, are, we are moving in the right direction that will mean d 2 number of 0. So, if I see I am moving in the right direction I can continually label the adjacent cell 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in, one, in a single step itself. Okay. This is the idea, but however, here the path retracing is not so simple. So, you need some data structure, you need to keep track of uh, some additional information and some degree of searching also. This is the price you are paying. Okay. So, let us illustrate this Hadlock's algorithm for this example, where here again we are showing a just array of grid cells with the black regions identified as obstacles, this is your source, this is your target. Okay. So, starting from S, we start labeling the cells with D 2 numbers. Now, look at one thing, the S is here, T is to the right and to the top of S. So, any movement towards right or towards top will not increase the D 2 number. So, it means you are moving in the right direction, but the top is blocked, you cannot move on the top the only way in which you can move in the right direction is towards right. So, in this way you can move by two cells here and here, after that again you stop, you cannot move in the right direction because right and top both are blocked. So, in the first step you are labeling like this, d 2 number 0 that means you are moving in the right direction, you can move only up to this much, after this you cannot move any further. So, you will have to make a detour. So, what kind of detour you can make? So, from 0 you can move this side, 0 you can move this side, from S you can move this side, from S you can move to the left. This all will mean a detour of 1, I mean that means one cell you are moving means away from T, which means like this. Not only this, so once you have moved one cell to the left of S and label this cell as 1. I mean as I said that you are free to label the cells as long as you are moving in the right direction, not one as many as you can. So, you continue the process from here. So, as soon as you label this particular cell as one, from here you can see your T is to the right and top. So, any cell to the top or right you can go on labeling with 1 1 1, because you are not making any other detour, okay. detour is not changing d p is not increasing. So, right, right, right you go on labeling, labeling till you reach here, but if you reach any further this will involve another detour, because you are going above t. So, now these will become two labels if you want to move up. So, you go and go on labeling here as long as your detour number does not increase. So, we fill so many cells in the second step. After you have done this, in the third step you have to take another detour, that means you have to either move up or in this case move to the left or in this case move down. So, like this, these cells will be marked as 2, 2 here, 2 here, 2 here or 2 here. Now, you see from here again you have to take another detour to reach T, because there is no other path in the right direction you have to move up 
or here or here all three, but you see this two if you move here as three in this cell from there your T will be on the right and down say you can continue with three 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 like this that means you will get something like this. So, here d 2 number 3 you are getting, but here as you get 3 you can continue with 3 because there is no further detour here. So, you have got a path the path will look something like this. So, where you have taken 3 detours one detour here another detour here another detour here. So, your total path length will be Manhattan distance between S and T plus twice into d p which is 3, but as I said in this case the retracing is not that trivial you have to do some kind of searching of the cells which you have labeled. So, I am not going into the detail of that, but just remember that your retracing is a little more complex here, but the advantage is that you are means at every step you are labeling a number of cells as long as you are moving in the right direction you are not spreading unnecessarily the labels in the wrong direction. You are moving away only when required, only when you see that you cannot move in the right direction, then only you move away. Okay. This is the basic concept behind Hadlock's algorithm and the performance is, is means of course, better than Lee's algorithm, because it labels much less number of cells in general and it runs faster naturally. But, uh, the problem is that the memory complexity or storage complexity does not change much, because here also you are keeping the data structure as a two dimensional array. So, if it is a 2000 by 2000 grid, you have to maintain that 2000 by 2000 array to store the status of each of the cells, right. Okay. So, these are the advantages this I have mentioned and running time of course, it is difficult to analyze exactly, but it has been found that for n by n grid the running time for connecting two points ranges from means order n which is a linear time algorithm to order n square. It of course, depends on where the obstructions are located which are the positions of S and T and so on, okay, but this is the average case. Okay. Now, let us come to an alternate class of algorithms line search algorithm. Okay, let me try to tell you the basic concept here first. Now, in the maze running algorithms what we are doing? We were basically representing the layout surface as a two dimensional array, where each element of the array represented a cell and we were labeling the cell and carrying out some kind of a search so that from source we reach the target right but in case of line search algorithm the concept is somewhat different i am not representing the area as a two dimensional array anymore i only have the total area available to me here here we maintain information about a number of straight lines so our data structure here will be different we have to maintain a number of straight lines, straight line can be represented by the n coordinates, two coordinate means a straight line and also you will have to search whether two straight lines are intersecting each other, if they intersect what is the point of intersection. Well, you can use simple coordinate geometry for that you already know this is means school math stuff that is easy. So, let us uh, try to explain uh, the motivation behind it before I explain the salient details. The idea is that suppose I have a rectangular area in which I have to lay out the points. Let us say I have a source here, I have a target here. Well, in the earlier case what we are doing, we were propagating the waveforms labeling the adjacent cells in a grid, so that the numbers finally will reach t. But here we use a very simple concept, just assume for the timing that there are no obstacles, well in presence of obstacles we shall see later. 
what you do from this you know, this point s you just imagine two straight lines one horizontal and one vertical these two straight lines are coming from s call them s1 and s2 similarly from t you start in a similar way a horizontal and a vertical straight line call them t1 and t1 now if we find well here uh, just again talking about the data structure you have ls ls is a set of lines starting from s similarly you have lt which is this set of lines starting from t now at every stage we check whether any line from this set ls whether they intersect lt or not we say i am not saying this is set intersection what i mean to say is that if a line from this L, whether it intersects it, that means what we are checking whether let us say L 1 belongs to S, belongs to L S, sorry, L S intercepts another line L 2 which belongs to L T. So, we are checking this at every step. There can be multiple intersections like in this case one intersection is happening here, one intersection is happening here. Let us say we take this as the intersection. So, once we find the intersection we can trace back from there up to t and up to s. We can trace the red lines to go up to t, we can trace the green lines to go up to s. So, you see what you have? We have already got a path between s and t. The concept is very simple. This is how we get a path between s and t. The advantage you can immediately see. So, we are not labeling cells, we are not using very large storage. Only in, in this particular example, we have to keep track of 4 straight lines means 4 into 2 8 coordinates and some simple coordinate geometry algebra to detect whether the lines are crossing or not. If they cross what is the coordinate. Okay. So, once you have the coordinate you can get the line segments that constitute the, the path or the obstacles. Of course, you have to keep some information about the obstacles in your data structure that these are the places where some obstacles are there. So, your data structure will be slightly more complex than straight lines, not only straight lines, you also have to represent some rectangles, which represent some obstacles already placed. You cannot drive a line across an obstacle, okay? that you have to follow some other path. Okay. Let us come back to this now. So, in this line search algorithm, the basic idea is that just the example that I have shown. So, here I state the same thing. So, assuming no obstacles, a vertical line through S and a horizontal line through T will intersect and vice versa. Same, same, same is some horizontal line through S and a vertical line to through T can also intersect. And once we get an intersection, you get the Manhattan path between S and T that will be the shortest path. But when there are obstacles, the complexity increases and you may have to draw several such set of lines. Now, one point to note 
in this line search algorithm is that they are very fast. And so, most of the CAD algorithms which do area routing, they rely on these line search algorithms. But these algorithms do not always guarantee generating the best path or the shortest path. And secondly, they may need backtrackings because you are following a path you find that you have reached a dead end, you may have to go back and try an alternate path such scenarios can also occur and as it said the routing area and also the paths are represented by the set of lines and not as a two dimensional matrix as in the maze routing algorithms. Okay. So, we shall be looking at two different algorithms. The first one we refer to as Mikami and Tabuchi algorithm. This was these are the two persons who propose this algorithm. So, here let me just explain this step, then I will illustrate with an example. So, the two terminals to be connected are S and T. So, the initialization step let us call it step 0. Generate four lines, two horizontal and two vertical passing through S and T. Okay, let us just work step by step with an example. Generate four lines passing through S and T. Okay. Let us take an example like this. You see this example? This example shows a source point, a target point and some obstacles already there. So, the step 0 says you generate four lines. So, I generate a horizontal line passing through S like this and a vertical line passing through this. I call them S 0 and S 0. Similarly, from the target I am using a different color. A horizontal line and a vertical line. Let us again call it T 0 and T 0. This is the first step. Now, as you can see because of the obstacles these lines are not intersecting because these lines are getting stopped. So, you need some more iterative steps. So, what next? Okay. The next step says you extend these lines till they hit obstructions or the boundary of the layout. Uh, if a line generated from S intersects a line generated from T, then a connecting path is found. So, you see here we have extended these lines till they either hit the boundaries of the obstructions, the obstructions or the boundaries of the layout, okay. obstructions or the layout and if they intersect which they are not. So, if they would have intersected I would have found for example, if the target was here then this horizontal line would have intersected here directly. So, I would have got a path, but it has not intersected so far. So, these four lines they are considered as trial lines of level 0, this 0 as this suffix indicates the level. So, what is mentioned here? If they do not intersect in this example it is so that identified as trial lines of level 0 which we store temporarily for further processing. We have to manipulate these four straight lines further. So, how do you manipulate? That is your step i of the iteration where i greater than 0 because step 0 you have already done. See the idea is simple you try to understand pick up trial lines of level i plus i minus 1, 1 at a time. So, you are now at step 1 i equal to 1. So, you pick up trial lines of level 0, there are 4 such 1 at a time. So, along the trial line all its grid points are traced. Starting from the grid points new trial lines of this new level i are generated that are perpendicular to the trial line of level i minus 1. Let us try to work out this. 
So, what are you saying? Two things along the trial line, the grid points are traced, and starting from these grid points, new trial lines which are perpendicular to the original trial line they are generated. Let us see. So, let us look at one of the time, let us say this one, this horizontal. Let us say along the grid, I have one grid point, let us say here and one grid point here. So, the grid points are imaginary, grid points are not actually stored anywhere. So, you know that what is the minimum separation. So, you just imagine this grid point, let us say here there are four. Similarly, in this direction for this line, there may be one grid point here and there can be some grid points here. Right. Now, along these grid points, you throw next level trial lines which are perpendicular to this. Okay, let me use a different color. Let us say I use a trial line like this, I call it S1. So, across all the grid points, I am doing this, I am drawing so many trial lines. Some of them will be hitting the obstacle, some of them will be crossing. Like this will go, similar in, the, in this direction, the, the other direction will be doing the same thing. These all will be labeled as S1, 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 S1 and S1. Similarly, in this direction, there will be trial lines like this, like this, like this, like this and so on. They will all be labeled again as S 1, these are all S 1, right. Now, you see here you need not have to, okay, the the same thing you would have done here, like here also you would have identified the grid points and you have drawn the horizontal and vertical things. But what you see that you have already got an intersection of a red and green lines here, one coming from T and the other coming from S, this T 0 and S 1 are intersecting here. Now, as you got a path intersection like this, you can trace back a path like up to here, then you go here up to this grid point, and you have got a path. So, you see the, the idea is very simple, you do in this way and you will reach a stage where some line starting with from T and some line starting with S will intersect and you keep carrying out this check at every step and once they intersect you, you means, means you have obtained a path, you can trace back and find a path. So, this is the essential idea behind uh, the Mikami and Tabuchi algorithm and this algorithm actually guarantees to find a path if it exists. right? Now, this example we have shown. Okay. Now, you see this is an improvement over the Mikami Tabuchi algorithm. In the Mikami Tabuchi algorithm along the lines, I am looking at every grid points and I am running so many perpendicular lines along each of the grid points. So, what Hightower's algorithm says is that you need not have to run so many perpendicular lines, number of lines can be drastically reduced. Okay. So, very quickly let us see the steps. So, instead of generating all line segments that are perpendicular to a trial line, you consider only those lines that can be extended beyond the obstacle which has blocked the line, blocked the preceding line. So, you try to find out something called escape point and escape line, I will explain this with the example. So, you try to find out escape point and escape line and you draw the perpendicular lines only at the escape points. The steps of the algorithm are similar, you pass a horizontal and vertical line through source and target, the first level port, 
if they meet path is found. Otherwise, pass a perpendicular line to the previous probe line, but not at all grid points, only at the escape points. Okay. Let us see the concept of this same example. Let us see. So, we consider this example here. So, again the same example. So, the first step is same as in Mikami Tabuchi algorithm. We run so, a horizontal and vertical line both through S and T. Well, I am showing it in the same color. So, the labels will be S 0, this will be S 0, this will be T 0, this will be T 0. Now, let us try to understand the escape points. See escape points means see this line, this line is hitting this obstacle. So, just a grid point just before the obstacle that is identified as an escape point. So, know where it is hitting. Okay. Similarly, this line is hitting the obstacle. So, a line just before that you can take this as an escape point. Similar is the case, the vertical line does not hit any obstacle. So, you can take a grid point just here. So, so on these grid points, you run perpendicular lines. You run a perpendicular line like this, call this S 1, call a perpendicular line, draw a perpendicular line here, call this S 1 draw another perpendicular line here, call this also S 1. Now, with respect to these perpendicular lines, you identify escape point like this. You see, this line S 1, this is running very close to the obstacle parallel, but it is not hitting it anywhere else. Okay. Well, it is hitting it here, so means you will be getting one escape point here. And another thing, you also check where it is just crossing the boundary of the obstacle, it is here. So, just beyond that, this will be another escape point defined. Similarly, for this line S 1, so it is hitting here of course, and it is here it is just crossing the boundary. So, there will be one escape point here. Similarly, for this green line S 1, so there will be one escape point defined here, where it is just crossing this another escape point defined here, just crossing this. So, on this escape points, you define another set of perpendicular lines. So, for this, the perpendicular line will be like this, this will be your S 2, on this your perpendicular line will be this. this will also be S 2. So, on this the perpendicular line will be like this. So, this process will continue, okay. this will be T 2 and here it will be like this. T 2. So, now you have seen that, that one line from S and one line from T has intersected. Now, there are in fact many such. So, just one such intersection is here, one such intersection is here, so you can take any one of them. Hmm. For example, if you take this one, this intersection let us say, then your path will be like this, then your path will be via this, via this, via this, via this, then this, via this via this, via this. So, you can see, uh, so in Heiter algorithm you can generate some paths, which run close to the boundaries of the obstacles, which will not unnecessarily congest the remaining part, because if you run a wire like this, it can unnecessarily stop the other wires from coming in this area. Okay. So, it is 
trying to trace the paths using some lines which are running parallel and close to the boundaries of the obstacle. So, this is the basic idea behind Hightower's algorithm. You can see that the number of lines you are considering is much less than Mikami Tabuchi algorithm, but the only computation you have to do is that you have to identify the escape points. So, this is also not very computationally involved. You have the data structure to store the rectangular obstacles and just using simple coordinate geometry you can identify these escape points, right. So, lastly we look at very briefly some something called Steiner trees which we mentioned earlier. Steiner tree means a set of points interconnected by horizontal and vertical segments is called a rectangular Steiner tree, where some bends can be they are allowed even at points where there are no terminals like here. Okay. Now, the advantage of Steiner tree is that this is how we actually do the layout and the interconnection length is typically less as compared to simple point to point routing, but the problem is that the general shortest Steiner tree, Steiner minimal tree problem detection of that is is computationally complex, complex. So, there are Steiner tree based algorithms, we are not going into detail of this here. So, here we are trying to address the goal to minimize the sum of the lengths of the edges of the tree. Well, exact versions exist, but they as I said it is an NP hot problem, you can get the exact solution only for very small problem instances. But for larger problems, some approximate heuristic heuristics exist. And also you can have weighted Steiner tree means instead of giving equal weights to all the edges, you multiply uh, the weight with a the length of a segment with a weight parameter w. This weight indicates the congestion of that area. So, if you are running a net through a region which is highly congested that weight value should be higher you should try to avoid the congested regions okay and some works have been done where steiner tree with arbitrary orientation particularly diagonal connections 45 degree angle connections are also allowed so there are some grid routing algorithms which are also based on steiner tree so, with this we come to the end of this lecture. Thank you.